Hi guys, it's John back here with another model inbox review. Today we're looking at the United States Army's World War II White M3A1 half track. Um, <clears throat> and yes, it's another airfix kit that I'm doing. Um, I just wanted to show you something that off this wartime image, which is quite interesting, it's quite nice. This is pretty much the Airfix kit um, in all its glory. This is exactly what you get when you buy the Airfix model. Um, the only th difference between this image is, and the, the model that you actually get, is that the armoured flap for the side window is actually in the downward position. and In the model it's actually slammed shut. and the, I don't even think there's actually um, a seam line there on the part. But this, this window flap here was actually an armoured flap that had a little slit in the side of it. <coughs> and a lot of half-tracks um, that you see in real life, you know, they, they often have this, this flap removed completely. But it was actually a hinged flap that offered the driver some sort of protection against bullets coming in from the side. Um, and I just wanted to point that out, that, you know, it's not a fault with the kit. It's the flap is in the upward position on the model itself. We'll start off with the boxing history. Whoops, I'll take that off, you don't need to see that. Um, this was the first release that Airfix did with the M3 half track. It was just called the M3 half track in those days. Um, and this was 1966. This was going back to a Type 3 header bag uh, with a red stripe on it. And I just want to let you in on a little story because I remember. Um, a few months back I did a video on Matchbox models and what they meant to me and I did mention in that video that the first kit I ever built was a Focke-Wulf FW190A from the Matchbox range, the Matchbox Purple range and that is true that it was the first kit I ever built but it wasn't the first kit I ever bought the first kit I ever bought was one of these on a Type 4 header bag kit an M3 half track and yeah, I was five years old. I can remember dragging my mother into town um, because my brother built models. He was quite a prolific builder in his uh, boyhood and teens and whatnot. And um, I remember I wanted a piece of the action, if you like. And I dragged my mother into town and we went into Woolworths. Um, a lot of people don't realise, but Woolworths was actually the main stockist of Airfix kits for a god awful long time. Um, certainly right the way through the early 70s um, and it wasn't until um, dedicated toy shops started to uh, stock models in a big way that Woolworths lost their almost if you like exclusivity to selling Airfix models um, but they were the main stockists at the time and I, I remember dragging her into Woolworths and I bought one of these and I can remember that the kit was purchased for the the pauper sum of 19 and a half pence. Um, long, long way to the, uh, the, the 6 99 that they cost now as a Series 1 kit. Um, yeah, so that was the FX release 1966 on a bag kit. The, the next release was not really an FX as say release, but this kit wasn't available in Europe. It was actually a, a kit sold through their American MPC uh, marketing label for Airfix and they released this kit on a Battle of the Bulge diorama set with a few of the uh, US infantry so they might even be paratroopers I don't know why they're paratroopers in the Battle of the Bulge they should just have been uh, infantry but never mind um, with the um, the M3A1 half track a nice feature of this picture is that the half track comes with the the canvas uh, roof that is actually on the kit. You get this canvas roof as an option on the kit. <clears throat> but on the, the, uh, the version of the kit's instructions that I'm going to show you later, they don't even mention this uh, canvas hood in the model at all anyway. It's ju they just want you to build it with the, uh, the .30 calibre Browning machine gun mounting. But anyway, that's the Battle of the Bulge set. That was released in 1972. And then in 1973, you had the first of the blister packs. These were released Type 4 um, packs, packaging for Series 1 kits, um, and they incorporated the HO00 scale into the package and the Airfix logo, which was their normal round logo there. The thing I liked about the bag kits and the, the blister packs is that you could actually see 
what you've got in the kit and there are quite a lot of parts to the uh, the half track and you'll see that in a minute because the, the, the kit has quite a lot of parts so 1973 uh, went from the blister pack and then you went into the first boxing packaging um, this was still under the guise of Airfix, of course. They went into the boxing packagings for Series 1 kits in uh, the mid-1970s. Um, and this was the first boxing that they released for Series 1 models. Interesting that it states there, figures not included. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Anyway, 1975 went through to 1981. And 1981, I think, was the year that Hella... No, sorry... 1981 was the year that Airfix started to run into problems and they started having serious sales problems because there was a massive recession on. Petrol was going through the sky, the Labour government were in charge um, and the miners were on strike and it, oh, it was a nightmare. Living in England was a nightmare and trying to sell plastic model kits was also a nightmare and lots of companies actually went to the wall in the early 80s turn the 1980, 81, 82, they, they, just, they just went into liquidation, never seen again. Um, and Airfix weathered the storm. This, this boxing was quite interesting because it went, it's the first showing of the oblong-shaped uh, Airfix logo. Um, and this boxing is actually the same size as the previous boxing, but uh, there's no border, there's no, um, you know, the picture goes right up to the edges of the top of the box, which is I think quite nice. It looked, it, you know, I liked this boxing. It was quite nice. So 1981 went through to 1987, um, and a lot happened between 1981 and 1987 because in 1981, Airfix actually went into liquidation and was purchased by a company called Mattel in America, who had a holdings company for the sales of toys and games in Europe called Panatoy, and Panatoy as a company, bought Airfix lock, stock and barrel and they purchased the moulds and everything, just started building model kits under the Airfix branding and just carried on where um, Airfix went into trouble. And they just carried on and just picked up the stick and just carried on hitting people with it. Exactly the same way. And of course, um, when 1987 came in, 1987 was the year that um, Heller and Humbrol Group purchased Airfix off of, off of Palatoy because Palatoy just did not, they didn't really market Airfix in the way that it needed to be marketed um, and I think when Heller and Humble Group bought the company up they marketed it the same way that they did Heller and Humble Kits but what it gave Heller and Humble Group was, was an enormous model range to uh, delve into and also another brand to sell their own stuff from. And it worked quite well for Hella, quite well indeed. This was the first boxing of Hella. One of the reasons why you can always tell a Hella boxing from any other company's boxing is the white border that always features around the photographs. And also Hella utilised a brand new picture of the M3A1 half track. It's also the first time I think that the M3A1 designation was applied and that the company whites was introduced in the marketing of the kit as well. But also, something else that Heller did that I really did not like, and they did this with an awful, awful lot of models over the years. They raised the series from Series 1 to Series 2, as you can see down here, um, which meant that they could sell the kit for, I mean, it wasn't double the price. It was probably an extra 30 or 40p, maybe even an extra pound by 1987, I'm not sure. Um, but they certainly weren't 20 pence a, a, a kit for Series 1 in those days. So that's 1987. Then you go into 1995, and this was the second release um, of the Humbrol Heller Group boxing. Uh, it, it was basically the same as the previous boxing, but um, you had the Flying Hours logo on the front, which was something that Heller and Humbrol Group introduced in about the mid-1990s in order to produce another incentive to sell models. Basically, you got one Flying Hour for each series on the, on the kits, you know, so like it would be Series 1 kit, you'd get one flying hour. Series 2 kit, you get two flying hours and so on. And the flying hours you could send off to uh, Airfix and uh, trade it in for uh, models against flying hours. It was, it was a really, really clever idea. And Humbrol and Hello Group, I think they did quite well out of it because the sales of the kits went up quite a lot. But you have to understand 
that the model industry as a whole by 1995 was suffering dreadfully because um, of the computer gaming industry. The computer gaming industry had been introduced in people's homes for children to play on since 1990. Um, and by 1995, you were on the cusp of what was going to be a revolution in terms of gaming at home and home gaming. The following year, in 1996, of course, the PlayStation was released, and that sort of revolutionised gaming as a whole. But um, Humble and Hello, they they ran into serious issues, and by 1995, they were they were considering, you know, drastic options as to what to do. Um, but this this was the boxing of 1995, and Heller and Humble Group, I think, I think they did another boxing option. Uh, 2000, sorry, 1998 was another release, different style of boxing. Um, this kit had already been raised to Series 2, but a number of other Series 1 kits had been raised to Series 2. But they introduced a new shape and size of box, and this was it. In 1998, they introduced a type of boxing where Series 1 and Series 2 kits actually were packaged in the same size box. And it sort of it made sense because you could half your costs of boxing if you only had one type of box and got rid of the smaller ones. And you could also put the price of your Series 1 kits up and your Series 2 kits up and it wouldn't be so no noticeable on the shelves because the boxes were bigger. A lot of people bought Series 1 kits not realising they were Series 2 and they paid the extra money thinking that oh, well, they've just gone up in price. And that's what happened. And when the industry found out about it, the, uh, the modelling industry and sales dropped for Airfix considerably. They dropped for a lot of other com companies as well because by 1998 you were looking at um, games consoles in every home. The PC was being, you know, like the toy of the future and children just lost interest in the, in the modelling industry. But there were some old diehards, um, like teenagers, 20 and 30 year olds, who carried on building models, diorama sets, IPS competition owners and professional model builders. And so a lot of the model companies managed to just drag themselves through. But unfortunately, Humbrol and Heller hit the floor. 1998 was a bad year for Humbrol and Heller and they reboxed another tooling of this kit in 2005 as a last ditch attempt to try and make more sales. And this was the boxing that came out. It was a nice, brighter sort of image for the for the kits at the time. And they did away with this white uh, border, and they, they went with a sort of a, a grey line and, and... Sorry, a white line and grey border at the bottom. Um, which, <laughs> it did brighten the look of the kits on the shelves. It did make it look quite nice. And this, this kit, I, I think this particular boxing is, is really attractive for this model. It, you know, it looks really nice. So 2005, this was the last um, boxing for Heller and Humble, and they actually went into liquidation and they were on the, the sales market for about 10 months before Hornby Group purchased them up lock, stock and barrel. <clears throat> uh, sorry, this wasn't the, la the last. The last one was 2008, because I don't think Hornby and Humble Group, uh, Hornby and bought Humble Group until about 2009. But this, this was the last. Again, it's a variation on the previous boxing. Um, but there is some differences in the, the logo writing and whatnot. Um, but this, this was definitely the last uh, boxing from Heller and Humble Group. In 2012, Hornby bought... Uh, sorry, by 2012, Hornby had been producing models with a new style of box, this red border box with a photo in the middle. One of the things that's really interesting about what they've done is they've utilised the original picture from the bag kit back in nineteen back back in nineteen sixty six, and they've superimposed that image of the half track with the trailer with a field at the back instead of like a, a drop with another road going down with other vehicles going past it, and uh, yeah. It just, um, it's a difference, isn't it, to the, the photo image, and I, I quite like this. The kit, obviously, a lot of people don't realise, um, but the kit comes with two options. Um, you can build the kit with a .30 calibre um, ring-mounted machine gun above the hood. <clears throat> I didn't really, I've never really liked to put in this particular one on the Airfix kit, because there's no steel top to the cab. It's just an open affair, which is a bit of a shame, really. But they also incorporate a hood made of canvas 
Um, it's a plastic part, obviously, but it, it's the canvas roof for the for the for the hood on the half track, and I actually think it looks better on the model because it ties in with the one-ton trailer's roof that's on the back. Um, but there's no mention of it in the instructions, uh, as I said before, when you see them. Um, so that was the Hornby Boxing 2012, and I'll just leave you with an image there of a nice half track that's been restored to running condition, and it looks very nice indeed. I think this one is actually in England. Not 100% sure, but I think it's in England. Um, so that's the M3A1 half track. I just want to pan the camera down very quickly because I want to go through this inbox with you. There's not a huge amount to go through on the packaging and uh, sorry on the on the, the parts and whatnot. And the kit itself is actually quite it's quite a simple kit really. Now then, I'll just open the box. <coughs> the box lid on this kit is actually quite tight. And then what I'll do, we'll take the um, take the instructions and decals out. We'll go through those and oops, we'll go through those in a minute. And then I'll, I'll just pull these parts out into here, because most of them are on sprue. There's only one part that's not on sprue. I just quickly want to show you the instruction sheet. The instruction sheet is a typical instruction sheet that you got in the days when Heller owned um, Airfix. The sheets themselves, they looked like photocopies. Um, I've had a couple of these on inbox reviews with other kits that Hem Airfix had released under the Heller ownership. And they're, they're much of a muchness. They look like they're photocopied about 20,000 million times. And this is a copy of a copy of a copy, if you know what I mean. Um, Airfix logo and the uh, designation at the top there, what the kit is. And then you've got five different languages giving you some gum from the, the half track itself. A bit of um, background information. There's one thing on the background information I did notice where it says, I don't know if you can make it out there. It says, during the war, more than 41,000 vehicles were produced by the White Motor Company. Well, that's not actually true because there were four companies that manufactured the half-track during World War II. White definitely manufactured it, but they didn't build 41,000. There was a company called Detroit Arsenal who also built Sherman tanks during the war. And Detroit Arsenal built a large, they probably built the majority of um, the half-tracks that were manufactured during World War II because of their factory facilities that were available to them. And then there was another company called um, Autocar that also produced quite a lot of military vehicles and they produced a large number of half-tracks during the war too. And there was a fourth company called International Harvester who produced a large number of these vehicles as well. And in actual fact, if you put all those companies together as manufacturing figures, there were over 46,000 of these things produced during World War II and probably up to the end of 1945 when production ended. Um, there was also a company in the Soviet Union that copied these vehicles um, because the Russian army actually liked the half-track so much that uh, they, the authorities in Russia authorised the copying by a company. I'm not sure which company built them, but there were a couple of thousand built by this company in the Soviet Union, making the total number of half-tracks built to over 48,000. And as such, it constituted one of the largest number of tracked vehicles produced during World War II. Um, I think it was only surpassed by the Universal Carrier, which was the most manufactured track vehicle in history, the British Universal Carrier. Now then, <clears throat> the instruction leaflet has got some nice information there on... Uh, information that you'd need to know when building the, the kit um, and it's in lots and lots and lots of different languages I think it's in 12 different languages which is nice and you've, you've also got a key code there at the bottom which gives you IDs to what to do with certain parts when you come across them in the, in the build the kit actually comprises seven stages of build with the eighth stage being the paint guide and I, I've always thought that Airfix models have been quite detailed when you consider that they're 0 scale or 176. Um, you know, they, they're probably as detailed as most 48 scale military vehicles. You've got wheels that rotate, you've got an axle with proper um, proper differential joints and going into them, you've got splitter boxes, you've got a detailed engine there in section 2, you've got an exhaust pipe and a tailpipe, you've also got uh, a, a drive diff for the tracks. A lot of people don't realise, but the M3 and M, well, all the, all the variants of the half tracks were actually track driven and front wheel drive. They weren't just driven by the tracks. 
which made them quite efficient, uh, if you like, steamrollers through mud. They were quite good at getting through mud on most occasions. The, one of the drawbacks with the Airfix kit, and is, is a drawback with several other companies that I've noticed, is that the track assembly is actually one part on both sides, part five and part four there, <clears throat> which makes painting them up a little bit of a, a pain in the neck, to be honest with you. Section three is the build, the initial build of the body shell. Um, quite a complicated body shell build on this because the cab and the body floor are actually separate. And then you you glue the sides of the body to the to the the floors of the vi of the vehicle basically, um, and then you've got the uh, the radiator louver at the front part seventeen which fits on the front of the cabin floor part thirteen. I do remember that when I built this kit when I was five, I could not get this section together. It just would not go together at all, and I think the main reason for that is is that I might have put part twenty two and twelve around the wrong way so that the back of the body shell theoretically would have made the back of the cab and vice versa and that's why I couldn't get the body shell together and I just yeah my brother had to bail me out because uh, the tears were horrendous but never mind stage four is finishing the body shell you've got the bonnet that goes on there you've got the uh, the windshield which is armored flaps um, you've got some bits and bobs that fit nicely on there you've got um, the steering wheel and the dashboard, the driver's figure there and two seats and the body shell. And you've also got some racking that goes on the side of the body there, parts 34 and 33. Um, one of the things I always find about Airfix kits is that with the military vehicles, the driver figures tend not to have any legs. Um, let's hope that the uh, half-track in this case was an automatic. Section 5 is the .30 caliber M2 Browning machine gun fit. Um, that's one of the optional parts that goes with this kit, although in these instructions they're just telling you it's not an optional part, you fit it automatic. But you, you can either have that part put in place or the canvas hood put in place, which I'll show you the part for in a minute. Uh, section 6 is final assembly <clears throat> of the vehicle anyway, and you've got the mud guards that go on there, the petrol cans on the side. Um, there's a, I think this is a winch assembly on the bottom here. Um, not 100% sure, but it looks to me like a winch assembly. And then the, the machine gun fit goes onto the roof there of the cabin. Um, yeah, so that <clears throat> that goes together quite self-explanatory, and it looks, looks like it's going to go quite easily. Section 7 is the trailer assembly, and the trailer assembly goes together in much the same way the body does. Um, I'll show you the parts for this, because they're actually quite nice. There's a, a canvas hood there, which is integrated in the... Um, in the instructions but it's interesting to note that the canvas hood is a part you do not cement in place it's just placed on the top so you can remove it and then use it for dioramas to fill it with whatever you like you know stores ammunition um, petrol anything really I mean it was utilized by the US Army and the British Army because the British and the French use this as well in the Western Front um, and it was utilized for a lot of different uh, a lot of different tasks Right, section 8 is actually the paint guide. The kit is basically green all over with black tyres and black tracks. The machine gun, they're telling you to paint it matte black, but in actual fact I would be tempted to paint it um, 85 semi-gloss black because most machine guns weren't actually matte, they were a shiny black sort of tone colour. And you've got, a, you've got a nice little wheel on the trailer, that's quite nice, isn't it? and a towing hook and everything. So the, the instructions are quite self-explanatory. They're quite easy to follow and not really a serious issue, other than the fact that they look like they're a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Now then, got a nice dust sheet for the decals here. I have got an issue with the decals, but I don't think it's going to be an issue which is going to stop me building this kit and using them. These are the decals I've got with this kit, and they are quite heavily water-damaged. Although, looking at the damage that's on the decals, I think it's just the backing film. It might just actually be the paper. The decals look like they've been... They, they don't look like they've been attacked by it whatsoever, do they? So I'm guessing that they're going to be all right. The actual register on the decals is quite good. They're, they're not that thick. Um, they look... You know, you can read what's on them. And... The backing film is quite thin, and they look nicely. They're a nice, colourful white decal. I quite like those. I think they'll go on quite nice. So that's the decals. 
quickly the parts. I want to go through the parts very quickly. I've just nudged the camera there. Sorry about that. Right, the body shell, first of all. <clears throat> the body shell incorporates the fixed um, in-position armoured side window there with a the little flap in the open position. You can actually close that on the real half track. But I think you'll agree with me that the detail on this particular kit, when you think it's it's 52 years old, isn't bad. You've got a nice little pick there and a, a shovel. There's some fittings that go on the side of the vehicle there, which are quite nice. The windshield, mud guards, they're all faithfully reproduced. There's the poor guy, the poor legless guy there. Um, don't know what he's going to do when he gets out of the vehicle. He's going to have to go into a wheelchair, isn't he? But, you know, he's got top pockets on his jacket, tunic. He's got a nice helmet. I think his facial features are a bit small to pick out there by the camera, but they have got facial features. Airfix figures for vehicles and pilots, I always thought they were quite good. And then you've got these dreadful, dreadful one-piece track units. The detail on isn't bad, but it's not great. Um, I've seen better reproductions of track units for, for half-tracks. Than that but you know it's an old mold so it shouldn't paint up too bad and event you know but it will be a bit of a nightmare to paint underneath those wheels and those um get the insides of the tracks painted the rest of it should be okay so that's sprue one sprue two is most of the trailer parts um, you can see the uh the canvas top for the trailer there it's quite nicely textured and you've got the trailer sides that incorporate the suspension leaf spring you got that into focus foil. The bands are on there quite nicely. That's an axle, I think, for the trailer. Uh, you've got quite nice wheels. I'll turn them over so you can see them. <clears throat> the wheels are quite nicely detailed, considering the age of this mould. They're quite nicely detailed. That's a little wheel that goes on the trailer. The tyre tread. One of the things that often happens with Airfix moulds is the tyre tread gets full of flash. I'm trying to get this in focus so you can see, but there is no flash on hardly any of these parts at all. And the tyre treads are really crisp clean, which is really, really good news because I built a Scammell tank transporter and God, that is a nightmare to clean the wheels up on that. The chassis on this kit is quite nicely and faithfully reproduced. Um, quite like that. I think there's quite a lot of detail in there. The engine there, the the, the front... Uh, differential to drive the tracks it's all incorporated there so that's that sprue there um, I don't want to go over that uh, that side of the body but I do want to pick out a couple of bits and bobs here the petrol cans here are quite nicely detailed can you see them and then you've got that winch assembly a couple of seats that go in the back that's the louvre that goes in the front of the, the body shell of the vehicle there's a few tabs there and a bit of flash that, but to be honest with you that's a little bit on the front of the body shell there as well. That that's this sprue is probably the only sprue that has any flash on it to write home about. Um, the rest of the parts are quite clean. There's the front diff there, exhaust system. Um, that's the point fifty caliber machine gun. Yeah, and there are the little racks that you know go on the side of the body shell. So that's that sprue as well. And then you've got this sprue which incorporates uh, the body floor, the cab floor. That's the body and cab floor there, and that's the rear end to the body shell. <clears throat> quite nicely detailed, I quite like that. And then you've got the wheels, which are also quite nicely detailed, and the tread on them is quite clean. I'll pull that out so you can see it a bit. Yeah, quite clean treads, and that's the mounting for the machine gun. And then you've got this really nice piece that's not even mentioned in the instruction leaflet, and this is the hood for the, sh for the body shell on the, on the half track itself. And the texture on it, I mean, you could rough it up a bit more if you wanted to to make it look a bit more canvassy, but it's not that bad, is it? You know, and when it's painted, I think it will come up quite nice. Uh, there is a loose part in here somewhere. If I can find it. I can't seem to find it at the moment, but it's actually the steering wheel. There's a steering wheel loose in here somewhere. <clears throat> Become apparent, I should imagine, one day. <clears throat> There's a steering wheel in the box somewhere. I don't know where it is at the moment, but I'll find it. Um, right, so that's the inbox review done. I just want to quickly go through the information on the kit so that we can close the video down. Um, basically, the Airfix 
kit is of a white M3A1 half track. It's molded in 176 scale and its release date is 1966. Kit's model number now is 02318. The decals supplied in the kit are for an M3A1 half track used by the United States Army during June 1944 of Operation Overlord, and the kit comprises 54 parts on four green plastic sprues. The dimensions of the model are three and a quarter inches long by one and a third inches wide by one and a third inches high, and the trailer adds another two inches in length by one inch by one inch width. The options and costs for this kit, there are quite a few options and costs just for the personnel carrier, the M3A1. Um, but basically in 76 scale, which is HO00 scale, you have the airfix option which goes, I've seen it go for as little as £3, but it usually goes for about 7 to 10 I've, There's a Fujimi model, which is based on the Nitto kit, which retails for between 5 and £10. There's Airfix's MPC battle set, that's the Battle of the Bulge set that we featured earlier. Um, and that kit, I've never seen it cheaper than 40 quid, and it's so rare that there aren't any on any sites anywhere at the moment. But I have also seen it go for as much as £65 when it was in really, really good condition. The Nitto kit is £12 to £15. The kit's also available in 72nd scale, and it's covered by Academy, uh, retailing price about £10 to £15. There's a company called Unimax Kits that produce the Forces of Valor um, range of models, and the Forces of Valor half track is 17 to £20. The Hasegawa kit, which was one of the original mini box series models, is six to thirteen pound. In the Hasegawa model that you can get in the shops now, it's usually around twelve ninety nine. The Italieri kit is eight to fifteen pound. There's a company called Model Miniature that produce the half track, and it retails between ten to fourteen pound. And Plastic Soldier is another company who release a range of military vehicles. The half track is based on the Hasegawa mold, retails about fifteen to twenty pound. You can get a kit of this in 156 scale from a company called Rubicon Models and they retail for between £15 and £20. And then there are two options utilising one of the moulds. Um, you have the 48 scale Academy mould which is based on the Bandai kit which is £20 to £35 and the Bandai kit's home boxing is £25. In 135th scale they're all standalone kits, they're not using anybody else's moulds. Academy release one for twenty to twenty six pound. ADV Azimuth produce one for forty pound. Best Value Model Company produce one for forty five pounds. Dragon produce one for forty five pounds. Monogram produce one for fourteen to twenty six pound. Nitto produce one for twenty to twenty eight pound. Tamiya's produces one, but it's an M three A two variant for thirty one to forty pound and Svesda do an M3 IDF variant with a 20mm mount on the roof for £56. The kits are wor worthy of note, um, in my opinion. The Airfix kit is actually quite a good offering. The, um, the Hasegawa models are usually quite good too. The Academy kit is, uh, well, to be honest with either of them, because they're based on the same moulds and 48 scale aren't bad, and the Tamiya kit is the benchmark, but to me, the Dragon model takes first place. But that's Svesda kit with a 20mm mount. I've seen it built up, and it's actually really nice. Conclusions. Well, where do I begin? The 1966 release, and it's a nice, crisp, clean kit too, with nicely moulded parts and very little flash, not even on a tyre tread, does actually build relatively nicely. Um, I've seen quite a lot of kits of this built up for dioramas and in various competitions and the Airfix kit does stand up quite well to its competition even though it was one of the first releases. I must admit I have built a couple of M3 half tracks before and Ravel do um, a matchbox mould of the M16 20mm quadruple mount anti-aircraft half track and that is really nice. But also the Hasegawa mini box versions aren't bad either, and I think the Airfix kit is okay. But you know, for those one piece track units, yeah, I think they could have done better than that, even in those days. But we'll see how they come out. It is a cheap kit though, and it's pretty easily obtainable. So, you know, if you're after a half track, the Airfix M3A1 probably isn't a bad option. And if you can get it for as cheap as I've seen it for three or four pounds, you know, you're doing really, really well. 
So that's it for the model in box review on the half track from Airfix. I hope this video has been of some use. I just want to quickly point out um, to my subbers, thanks very much for all the feedback and all the support that you've given me and also for answering a couple of questions that I've had over the last couple of inbox reviews. Thanks very, very much for all your replies. I really, really appreciate it. I think it's one of the reasons why um, the modeling community on YouTube is so, so good to be to get involved with because you guys have lots of information out there that is really important to share. And you know, for people building certain dioramas or other projects or whatever they're doing, buddy builds here and there, you know, the, that other people's information comes in real handy. So thanks very much for all the support. Um, and I'll see you for the next video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.